Thanks for listening to the program. I hope you'll support our guests by clicking on the book purchase link in this episode's description. Each purchase helps support local bookstores, and that's always a good thing. Just less than 24 hours before we were on the helicopter, uh, we had just lost, we knew we lost a helicopter that was carrying 16 men. So we were expecting the worst, and we were angry. You know, who, who dare attack us? That was our kind of our thought. And this time it was really close to home in the special operations community. We were pretty pissed off. We were ready to fight. An excerpt from today's guest, who's written a new book about the Army Ranger mission to rescue Marcus Luttrell, a lone survivor. Author Dr. Tony Brooks is here, and I'll speak to him right after this break. This is Point of the Spirit. Welcome back. I'm Robert Child. Today's guest enlisted in the Army in 2003 and entered the Ranger Indoctrination Program. He officially checked into 2nd Ranger Battalion in September 2004 and deployed to eastern Afghanistan in April 2005. His first mission was Operation Red Wings 2, and he's written an account of it. His book is called Leave No Man Behind, the untold story of the Ranger's unrelenting search for Marcus Luttrell. The book came out August 10th, and Dr. Tony Brooks joins us now. Tony, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Before we get underway, I, w- I just want to reference a review that's outstanding, a vivid, fast-paced, first-person account of the actions by U.S. Army Rangers on the ground in one of the episodes in Afghanistan that best illustrated the commitment in the Ranger Creed, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. An extraordinary and truly inspirational story of sheer determination, physical toughness, and mental fortitude, as well as a fierce desire to never let one's comrades down on the battlefield. General David Petraeus. Outstanding, Tony. Outstanding. I agree. I, when I heard that, I, I was floored. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, uh, did you met him? Do you know him? I don't know him personally. Um, I did. I did serve with his son, so that's that was our connection. And you know, when he sent this to me, I I couldn't thank him enough. I mean, it was everything I hoped it would be. Yeah, that's that's what a writer dreams of, right? You got it. Well, I've got a few questions on the on the book, and uh, first one is I understand. Operation Red Wings 2 was your first mission. Could you describe the emotions, especially after the Chinook helicopter went down, the emotions going in with your team? Yeah, I mean, being it was my first mission, I really didn't know what to expect. Uh, Being the youngest guy, one of the youngest guys on the helicopter there, and there's a few people younger than me, but I, I really looked at my leadership and kind of took their cues. And I had never seen them as they were going into this mission. They're usually a pretty, you know, serious bunch, but at the same time, very relaxed. And this time there, there was a different kind of seriousness to them. Uh, they knew they were going into something bad. So I just kind of followed their lead, really. You know, being that young guy, you, that's all you do. It's kind of like a child, right? Right. Yeah. Was there, um, I mean... It... You expect the seri- seriousness, absolutely. Was there an anger, too, about what had happened? Absolutely. Everyone was very angry. I mean, just less than 24 hours before we were on the helicopter, uh, we had just lost, we knew we lost a helicopter that was carrying 16 men. So we were expecting the worst, and we were angry. You know, who, who dare attack us? That was our kind of our thought. Uh, I, we knew it was war, but at the same time, you, you never really expected to happen to you or your guys. Right. It's always somebody else. And this time it was really close to home in the special operations community. So, it, you know, we were pretty pissed off. We were ready to fight. I can imagine. Marcus Luttrell, in interviews I've watched, has said that the real story, worthy of a, of a movie should be the rescue mission to find him, which was your mission. Do you agree with this? Uh, 
I don't necessarily agree completely with that. I think his story is his story and it's important. And I am very thankful that he's around to tell it. Uh, I would agree that the rescue mission has kind of been put on the back burner over the years, but you know what? Um, it was about him. That mission really was about him. He was the only survivor. So I, you know, I have no bad feelings or anything like that. I'm just happy that he's around and glad that I'm able to tell the story now. Right. What, um, did you know at the time that he was the only survivor? We did not. We actually, uh, my unit was primary concern was the downed helicopter and the, the crew and passengers on that heli uh, helicopter. Mm. So when we got on the ground, that was our primary mission. Um, someone at my rank didn't even know that there was a, a four man team still on the run is what we heard. So we had no clue what, what, where they were at the time. Mm. We thought maybe that they were all safe, but we also saw the carnage of the helicopter. So we had no idea that anyone was alive or if they were all dead or captured. We were kind of on the fly on the ground, just trying to figure it out as we went. Did you know where you were, you were actually going? Yeah, I mean, the start, of, the start of the mission, we knew exactly where the helicopter had crashed. So being our primary object objective, that was the first place we were headed. And uh, it was a little bit crazy when they dropped us on the ground. Uh, our unit had no maps of the area because of how remote it was. So we were using satellite imagery to guide us on the ground. And if you've ever seen satellite imagery, it's amazing, which the details you can see. But one thing you cannot see is the terrain. You can make guesses but you cannot see terrain on a satellite image. So when we were on the ground, we were shocked at the, the terrain that we ended up on. And it was difficult to get to that crash site. Mm. But once we were at the crash site, we found out there was you know, a four man team still on the run somewhere. We had no idea where they were. So our job was to comb the mountain systematically looking for intel trying to find them as fast as we possibly could. Tell us what the circumstances were that transpired that actually helped you finally find Marcus. What we had heard on the ground was that a villager, a local villager had gone to the local military base and said that they had a American and they were protecting him. Well, first things we hear on the ground, we hear that and we think, oh, this is a setup. Yeah, they might have the Americans we're going, but we're expecting to have to fight our way in and fight our way out. We had two possible locations of where he might be. So we just headed to those villages, my platoon to one and third platoon of Charlie Company, 75th Ranger Regiment, also went to another town. Mm. Um, what, what it turned out to be was three Charlie, which is my uh, the other platoon that I was with ended up in the village that Marcus was in. So they had no clue what they were going into and they were basically running into this village expecting to get shot at. Were there casualties in either uh, either of your squads? We had no casualties as far as deaths. We did have some injuries, but minor compared to what had transpired earlier. Uh, we had a broken arm on the, the fast rope into the, the mountain. Were you part of the uh, recovery of the other team members, of Marcus's team members? I was not. That was also three Charlie. I was primarily at the helicopter crash site, and then we went into the Korengal Valley searching for Marcus out there. Mm -hmm. So I was not specifically there when him and his teammates were recovered, but I'm very close to the guys that were. What prompted you to write the book? Was it something someone suggested or um, was it something that you felt you had to do? There's a couple of reasons. One is, yeah, I, I felt like the story had to come out eventually of uh, the rescue. You know, all these years, we kind of were waiting for someone to do it. And I got, kind, of got, kind of got tired of waiting and said, why, well, why don't I just do it? Right. 
I, I also had other motivating factors. I mean, I have two young children and I wanted them to know this story. I didn't want to go to my grave carrying this story. And that was probably the primary motivator was I need to get this on paper. I'm never going to be able to have this conversation with my kids. Yeah. So that was what initially got me going. We'll be back to the conversation after this quick break. It's rare that if I go to a public event that somebody doesn't come in and uh, comment uh, on either Gettysburg or Gods and Generals. Director Ron Maxwell on History Storytellers. You know, you, you never know how a film's going to be received when you make it, and you never know how it's going to be received uh, w with the passage of time. I think certainly in the case of, the, of Gettysburg, we started with an extraordinary novel, uh, Michael Shara's The Killer Angels. Great storytelling, great characters. And uh, then we had a great cast, uh, just a wonderful collection of actors, wonderful crew, and it was a magical time. I mean, we worked our butts off the summer of uh, 1992 at uh, Gettysburg when we filmed that. Uh, long hours, we had way too many setups that we could possibly have done per day, but we did it, we got the job done. And uh, we remain to this day a band of brothers and sisters, those of us who worked on that movie. Watch season one of History Storytellers on Amazon Prime Video. Now back to my conversation with former Army Ranger and author, Dr. Tony Brooks. So you went through the process of finding an agent and approaching a publisher? Yeah, I mean, that was a kind of a, a wacky deal. I actually, when I was thinking about writing it, I, I sent a LinkedIn message to a fellow author and said, you know, I'm thinking about writing this book about this story. How do I do that? I don't know what I'm <laughs> yeah. doing. And he, he basically said, you know what? Hold on. Don't do anything yet. Let me connect you with my guy. And that happened to be his agent in New York City. And that's kind of how it started. And it kind of snowballed from there. Uh, but just that simple reaching out, <laughs> acknowledging that I didn't know what I was doing uh, yeah. was the kind of the start of it. That's when people will help you, too, when you say, look, I have no idea what I'm doing. I need your help. And, uh, you know, people will jump in. Yeah, I think it's a lesson in life right there. Um, it goes with anything. If you're willing to learn and you have something that's of value, uh, people are going to want to help you. Yes, I agree with that. But it, but if you come in as a know-it-all, no one's <laughs> going to help you. You got it. <laughs> I can leave you to, to your own devices. The book came out August 10th, and it's been on pre-sale for a while. What has the reaction been in the Special Forces community to this book? Uh, I've had a mixed bag. I've had mostly the very excited people. Uh, there's a there's a few that, you know, aren't necessarily too happy about it. They kind of want this issue to go away, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> people are kind of sick of hearing about just the fighting, you know, the hero stories. They want to hear, they want to hear the the back stories, the the stories of the guys who came in when no one even knew they were there, and it's been fun. It's been fun hearing people, you know, motivating others to tell their stories. It's a big part of this. I, I want to make sure everyone knows that their story is important. They should share it. Absolutely. So there's, there's a lot of uh, very excited veterans out there. Have you talked to Marcus Luttrell at all on this? You know, I've never, I've, I did send him a copy of the book and I'm still awaiting some comments, but I have, I have never spoken to Marcus. I hope to someday soon, but I have to this date I have not. This is your first book, obviously. Do you do you plan more books in the future about your military experience? You know, I, I really enjoyed writing this book, and I do think I'm going to write some more. In fact, I've already started some other things, some other projects. Great. Uh, I may or may not get into more military stuff. I would prefer to move to more recent passions like my passion about health and wellness and helping veterans so that's kind of the path i'm i'm leading towards right now and that was one of my questions actually tell us a little bit about objective healthy and working with the veterans yeah so this is this is my big idea and this is uh, something that's still in the works and we're still working on it but my job is to educate veterans on how to live a healthier lifestyle 
know, one of the sickest populations uh, as far as demographics go in the United States are our veterans. They are chronically ill. They have lots of mental health issues. Their nutrition is just awful. You know, when you're in the military, everything is really set up to where you only have to know how to fight. You don't have to worry about what your next meal is. You don't have to worry about where to sleep. You don't even have to worry what, what clothes to put on every day because it's all picked for you. Yeah. So when people transition out of service, they're, for lack of better terms, they're lost. They have to relearn how to be a human again. And health is one of the areas that they tend to struggle in. And you can see the evidence in the, the VA system, which is um, sadly failing this our veterans. And it. it's going to take, I, I, my belief is it's going to take fellow veterans to reach out for, to look out for each other. It's not, no one's going to come out and save us. I mean, we have to save each other, I think. So that's my purpose behind mostly education is my goal. And then uh, possibly some products in the future, but mostly education is what I'm most concerned with. Now you're a chiropractor, correct? Yes, I am. Uh, did you get licensed after the military or were you a chiropractor before? No, after I got out of the military, I knew I wanted to help people. Um, I was planning actually go, to go to medical school straight out of the military. Uh, as I continued on that path, I had some health problems of myself. You know, I had, mm -hmm. I had um, some severe back problems that I couldn't seem to find anyone that could help me. And I was struggling and I kept trying different doctors and different modalities and nothing seemed to be really solving my problem. Well, yeah. my wife, being the amazing woman that she is, uh, forced me <laughs> against my will to go to a chiropractor. Uh. I didn't want to go. I didn't, you know, I didn't trust them. I didn't, I kind of grew up in a family that really didn't have a lot of nice things to say about chiropractors. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was going into it. That's how I felt about them. Well, I'll be damned if <laughs> the chiropractor didn't fix my back. Amazing. And when, what, after that happened, I kind of had this light bulb go off and be like, wait a minute, wait, I can help people. And, you know, I'm not gonna have to worry about people dying on my table. And oh, this sounds like an awesome career. I can, mm. I can be that guy that can just help me. And exactly. that's instantly my path changed to be a, become a chiropractor. Oh, and it's become your passion. It's, uh, it's, Absolutely. It sounds like that. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been to uh, chiropractors in the past and I, I, I didn't really know what to think about them before I went to my first one. And then when they cracked my neck, I said, oh, okay, that feels a little bit better than it was. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm always surprised at how people don't realize that they've lost range of motion. It yeah. goes it goes so slowly over time that, you know, someone's like, I can look over my shoulder when I'm driving my car now. I'm like, wait, what? What? Yeah. <laughs> You're telling me you yeah. couldn't look over your shoulder before you walked in here? <laughs> yeah. And they don't know it. Yeah. No, they have no clue. Yeah, I uh, they told me things about myself that I didn't know either <laughs> about my body, which uh, we got corrected. Thank goodness. Good. So you have more books planned in the future, not necessarily military, and you're you're working on objective healthy. Is this a national effort you're you're working? Yeah, on? absolutely. It's going to be. I'm going to start off with an online educational platform for veterans, and then from there we're going to expand out to physical locations, but, you know, I, I figured online is the best way to reach as many people as possible. So that's where we're starting. Great. And uh, what's the website address for people to uh, check it out? Right now it is in progress, but you can follow me at uh, drtonybrooks.com or drtonybrooks.com. That sounds great. Well, the book is called Leave No Man Behind, The Untold Story of the Rangers' Unrelenting Search for Marcus Luttrell, a Navy SEAL lone survivor in Afghanistan. Tony, thank you so much for being on the show today. I wish you great success on the book. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I always have a fun time chatting about my book and life in general. I appreciate it. You bet.
That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Next time, my guest will be Jared Frederick, co-author of Hang Tough, the World War II letters and artifacts of Major Dick Winters. And, you know, I, for as wonderful as Band of Brothers the series is, uh, the Dick Winters that it portrays is the Dick Winters as how his men saw him. And with these letters, we get a more intimate perspective about how Dick Winters saw himself. That's next time. You won't want to miss it. And stay up to date with all the upcoming guests. Just sign up for the Point of the Spear pipeline at robchild.net. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group. I wanted to take a moment to thank our growing army of listener-supported members. You make it possible to continue our mission of bringing you the best military history authors, filmmakers, and movers and shakers. If you're not a member yet, it's easy to join. It just takes seconds. Scroll down to the bottom of this episode's description and click the support link. You'll come to our anchor page, click the support button, then complete the brief form. It's that easy. We're planning loyalty perks and giveaways to roll out over the coming months for our early supporters who sign on before the end of the year. So to wait, become a member today, and thank you for your support.